in 4.2 part 2 we continue to learn about sigma notation and area. Now we're going to work with formulas for the right and left endpoints. In this example consider the interval AB so starts at A goes to B and it's divided into n intervals. So this would be the first interval, this is the second interval, third interval, and so on. Now the width of each of these little intervals is delta x. And we know that delta x is just equal to b minus a over n. The entire interval divided by how many sub-intervals we will have. We are being asked to find an expression for all the right endpoints. So in this first interval here, the right endpoint, let's call it x1, is here and it's the x value we would use for interval 1. Now to determine its value, x1 is equal to whatever the coordinate of A is plus going over a distance of delta x. So x1 is equal to A plus delta x. In region 2, this is the right end point here. To find the coordinate of x2, we could start at A and we could go over by 2 delta x. So x2 is equal to A plus 2 delta x. And in region 3, the right end point is here and you could start at A and go over by 3 delta x. So x3 is equal to a plus 3 delta x. So then if we look at this pattern here, we can see that xi is going to equal a plus i delta x. And this gives us the formula for all right endpoints. Now we are going to find an expression for all the left endpoints. We have region 1, region 2, region 3, and so on. Now in this first region, we see that the left endpoint is just A. So x1 is equal to A. For the second region, the left endpoint would be here, and we see that we could start at A and go over by 1 delta x. So x2 is equal to A plus delta x. In region 3, the left endpoint is here. So you could start at A and go over by 2 delta x and land on x3. So x3 is equal to A plus 2 delta x. So extrapolating here, to get x sub i, we see that the number of delta x's you need is always one less than the term you're on. So for the third interval, we needed two delta x's. For the second interval, we needed one delta x. And for the first interval, we needed zero delta x's. So then x sub i will equal a plus the quantity i minus 1 times delta x. 
and this gives us the formula for all the left endpoints. Now they're both pretty easy to use, but because the formula for right endpoints is a little bit simpler, when we have a choice, we like to use it. Now this brings us up to the main event of this entire section, which is the definition of area. Let f of x be continuous and non-negative on the interval a, b. Now you know what it means to be continuous. You can draw the whole graph without ever having to pick up your pencil. And non-negative is not the same as positive. Remember that y values can have three states. They can be positive, they can be negative, or they can be zero. So if f of x is non-negative, that just means it's either zero or positive. Or another way of saying f of x is non-negative is to say that f of x is greater than or equal to zero. Now the area of the region bounded by f of x, which is here, this curve, the x-axis, which we know is y equals 0, x equals a is of course this vertical line right here, x equals b is this vertical line, is given by this formula right here. Area equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i delta x. Now this is just areas of a bunch of rectangles. And you haven't seen this notation c sub i, but c sub i is just somewhere between the left endpoint of the interval and the right endpoint of the interval. So if you look at this picture, Here's a subinterval, this right here. x sub i minus 1 is the left endpoint. x sub i is the right endpoint. And this inequality is just telling us that c sub i lives somewhere in this interval. Then f of c sub i gives us the height of this rectangle. And we are going to use infinitely many of those rectangles to help us find the area under the curve. Now as before, delta x gives us the width of each interval, which is b minus a, the length of the entire interval, divided by n, the number of rectangles. Now, if you think about this, as n goes to infinity, the width of each of these subintervals is going to zero because with more and more rectangles, the width of each rectangle is smaller and smaller. So if you think of the left endpoint and the right endpoint crashing towards each other, as the interval gets smaller and smaller, well as the size of the interval approaches zero, the left endpoint and the right endpoint essentially become the same point. And that brings us up to this note that since c sub i can be any point in the interval between the left endpoint and the right endpoint, for convenience you may choose to use the right endpoints. c sub i can be a plus i delta x as that formula is the simplest. It's just a little bit easier to use 
and so we choose to use it in our calculations. In this example, we have to find the exact area under f of x equals 3x minus x squared on the interval 1 to 3. Now, you may remember that earlier we estimated the area under the curve using lower sum and upper sum. But now that we have the definition of area, we are going to be able to find the exact area under f of x. So remember this is a parabola with roots at 0 and 3. We know that the vertex was at 3 halves and the parabola opens downward. We are on the interval from 1 to 3 so then that means we are trying to find this exact area here. Now we just learned that area is defined to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i delta x. And we have to use this definition to find this shaded area. Now in order to do this successfully, it's best to first do the setup, which means to find delta x, which is right here in the equation, c sub i, which is the input to f and then find f of c sub i in a simplified form and put that into the area definition. We know that delta x is equal to b minus a over n which is going to be the end of the interval which is 3 minus the beginning of the interval, which is 1, over n, and this simplifies to 2 over n. Now we need to find c sub i because that's the input to the function in the area definition. So c sub i, we said we are going to use those right endpoints because it's just easier to do. So a plus i delta x, which is equal to 1. Remember a is the left endpoint of the entire interval, plus i times delta x, which is 2 over n. So c sub i is just 1 plus 2i over n. Next, we need to find f of c sub i because we will need to plug that in to the area definition. We know that f of c sub i means we are doing f of 1 plus 2i over n. Now remember that f of x is equal to 3x minus x squared. So when we plug this in, we will have 3 times 1 plus 2i over n minus 1 plus 2i over n squared. Now we have to simplify. We get 3 plus 6i over n minus the quantity. Let's square this binomial. Remember you have to do a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So 1 squared is 1 plus double the product 
So the product would be 2i over n, so we double that to 4i over n, plus the last term squared would be 4i squared over n squared. Let's clean this up. We get 3 plus 6i over n. Now we need to distribute this negative sign. So we get minus 1 minus 4i over n minus 4i squared over n squared. Simplifying, we get that f of c sub i is going to equal 2 plus 6i over n minus 4i over n is 2i over n and then we have minus 4i squared over n squared. Now we are going to substitute f of c sub i and delta x into the area definition. So our area is going to equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i which we just said is 2 plus 2i over n minus 4i squared over n squared times delta x which we know is 2 over n. So make sure you're comfortable here. This whole expression is f of c sub i and 2 over n is delta x. Now we will have to evaluate the limit of this summation. So let's start simplifying. We get limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n. We can distribute 2 over n times 2 is 4 over n plus 2 over n times 2i over n is 4i over n squared minus 2 over n times 4i squared over n squared is 8i squared over n cubed. Now we know that we can perform this summation on each of these three pieces separately. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n of 4 over n plus the summation i equals 1 to n of 4i over n squared minus the summation i equals 1 to n of 8i squared over n cubed. Now let's remember our summation formulas and it's important that you notice that the variable of the summation is i which means that anything that's not i gets treated like a constant. So 4 over n is a constant because there's no i variable in it. So we will be using the rule that says you take the constant times n to evaluate. Now for this second summation we see that we are summing over the i variable 
and the rule for that one is n times n plus 1 over 2. And in this third summation, we are summing over i squared, and that tells us to use the rule n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Let's continue to simplify here. We get that this equals the limit as n goes to infinity. For this first one, we have to take what the summation sees as a constant, which is 4 over n times n. That's applying this rule to this expression. Plus, once again in this summation, the 4 over n squared will be treated as a constant, so we can take it out front, and then we have to multiply times n times n plus 1 over 2 minus for this one the 8 over n cubed can come out front as a constant and we have to multiply by the rule which says n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Let's continue to simplify. We have limit n goes to infinity. Of course here this n cancels with this n and we get 4. Then we have to add. Now over here the 4 and the 2 cancel. We will just have a 2 left. This n is going to cancel one of those n's, so we will have left n plus 1 over n minus, we have 8 over 6, so that's 4 thirds, and this n will cancel one of these, so we'll have an n squared in the denominator. Now in the numerator, let's go ahead and foil out these two binomials. n times 2n is 2n squared. The outer inner, we will have n plus 2n, so that's adding 3n, and last times last is plus 1. We're going to continue to simplify because we still can't do this limit. So we have limit as n goes to infinity. You can see if we tried to do the limit in this step, we would get infinity over infinity, which is indeterminate. That's what drives you to keep going. So we can write this as 4 plus 2 times the quantity and now n over n is 1, and then we have plus 1 over n, and then minus 4 thirds times the quantity. We break this into three pieces. 2n squared over n squared is 2, plus 3n over n squared is 3 over n, plus 1 over n squared. Now we can go ahead and apply this limit and let n go to infinity. 1 over n is going to go to 0. If we plug it in here and here, we see that 3 over n is going to go to 0, 1 over n squared is going to go to 0. So now we have 4 plus 2 times 1 minus 4 thirds times 2. 
That's all we have to simplify now. So this is going to equal, well we can add these two, we get 6, this one is minus 8 thirds, so if we have 18 thirds minus 8 thirds, it will simplify to 10 thirds. So what we just discovered is that the area under f of x is exactly equal to 10 thirds. Now we can go ahead and compare this to what we got for the upper sum and the lower sum. Remember earlier we found that the lower sum was equal to 21 eighths and the upper sum was equal to 31 eighths. And we know that the actual area had better fall between those two values and we just got 10 thirds for the area. Sometimes it's easier to compare mixed numbers than improper fractions. We know 21 over 8 is just 2 and 5 eighths and that should work out to be less than 10 thirds which is 3 and 1 third which should work out to be less than or equal to the upper sum of 31 eighths which is 3 and 7 eighths. And so we can see that this actually does work out to be true. The exact area was bigger than the lower sum and smaller than the upper sum. In this example, we have to find the area under f of x equals x cubed on the interval 0 to 1. It's time to check your understanding, so pause the video to try this one on your own, then restart when you are ready to check your answers. All right, first order of business is to sketch a graph of x cubed. That's a pretty easy one. And we know that we are on the interval from 0 to 1. So we are trying to find this area. We know that the first thing we do is the setup and delta x is going to equal b minus a over n which is equal to 1 minus 0 over n which is 1 over n. Next we have to find c sub i and we use the formula for right endpoints which is a plus i delta x so that's going to be 0, which is the left endpoint of our interval, plus i times delta x, which we just found is 1 over n. So c sub i is pretty simple, i over n. Next, we have to find f of c sub i. So we plug c sub i, which is i over n, into our function f of x, which is x cubed. So that means we have to take i over n cubed, which is just i cubed over n cubed. Next, we will plug f of c sub i and delta x into the definition of area equation. We know that area 
is defined to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i delta x. So in our example we have that area is going to equal the limit as n goes to infinity summation i equals 1 to n. Remember our f of c sub i we found a minute ago is i cubed over n cubed so we plug that back in i cubed over n cubed and we have to take that times delta x which is 1 over n and always double check that you have everything f of c sub i is i cubed over n cubed delta x is 1 over n. Now this becomes the limit as n goes to infinity summation i equals 1 to n of i cubed over n to the fourth which equals the limit as n goes to infinity. Now remember the summation is going to treat the n to the fourth like a constant because the variable of the summation is i. So that's going to be 1 over n to the fourth out front. And then we are performing the summation on i cubed which we know is n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. So then this equals the limit as n goes to infinity. Let's take the 1 fourth and put it first and then this n squared will cancel two of those in the denominator. So now we have n squared in the denominator. We have to square this binomial in the numerator. So we get n squared plus 2n plus 1. Let's continue to simplify. We have limit as n goes to infinity of one-fourth times n squared over n squared is 1. 2n over n squared is 2 over n plus 1 over n squared Now we can go ahead and let n go to infinity. We know 2 over n will go to 0. 1 over n squared will go to 0. And this is going to simplify to be 1 fourth times 1. The only thing left from the inside the parentheses is this 1. which means that this area is equal to one-fourth.